Good morning, St. Barnabas. Um, as uh, White said, our reading is from John chapter 1, verse 43 to 51. And if you're using the Church Bible, it's page 749. John 1, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and preaching of his word. special to be with you, St. Barnabas. Uh, my, my wife sent a greeting. She would like to be here, but her sister in America just got married yesterday, so she's over there doing that. Um, she has our daughter with her. Um, my, my daughter called me up, I don't know, basically at midnight. Daddy, I have great news. I get to be a ring bearer. No, 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 a ring barrier. I get to be a ring barrier. Um, so it's, it's just me and the boys. But it's, uh, it's okay because there are different standards, unfortunately, for single fathers and for single mothers. Like, if, if, if you are a single mom, you get judgment. Like, why aren't your kids all wearing matching clothes? Why aren't they drinking kale smoothies for breakfast. <laughs> but if you're a single dad, the, the bar is very low. <laughs> they're, they're, oh, your, your kids are dressed. Oh, you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. Oh, just shame, man. Can I help? Can I bring food? I, I'm, yeah, it's, it's not fair. Single dads get support. Single moms get judgment. Um, but it was, it was special to be, to be asked to, to join you for Missions Sunday. And we, as on behalf of Hope Prison Ministry, really wanted to start by saying thank you. Um, you have, th this is a small church, but you have a prison ministry. Um, and, it, and it started because Ann and I both wanted to be on, at Paulsmore on a Sunday morning. And Raymond and Alita came and they, they, they tracked us down in our, in our living room. Uh, at the time, they, they, were, they were trying to build the, the children's program here, and, and they, they, were, they were like, please, can, you take our, can, can we take your children while you go to prison? And I, I don't think they regret it yet, but uh, maybe some days. Um, because there, there were only two children then. Now, now there's three. And I, I think maybe the verdict is out. Maybe you'll send us all back. Um, but no, it's, 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 it's very special. Even though my wife and I have been in, in ministry for many years, usually on a Sunday, we were having to do other things. Like she would be doing something with music. I'd be doing something with counseling. But in this prison ministry, we, we get to work together on the same team. And there's obviously no children's program there. 
So that wouldn't be possible except for the welcome that St. Barnabas gives to our children. So, so thank you for, for believing us, believing in us, and more importantly, for believing what God is doing behind bars. Um, and, and many people from this church, a, a bunch of the, the GWC guys have joined us over the, over the years in prison. And that's, that's been very special. When, when, when Alita asked me to, to give a sermon for, for Mission Sunday, there's, there's I, I'm, I'm always tempted to do something strange. It's like, no, it's Mission Sunday. You, you have to do Acts 1-8. You have to do Acts 1-8. But, but I, I thought, all right, let me at least, we, we have to do Acts 1-8, but let me, let me give it a twist at least. And so I want to, uh, I want to start with a, a short reading for you. And it's, it's Luke introducing his, his, his next book. He says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I love this passage for for three reasons. First, I I, I see it as as proof of the resurrection. Um, We we hear uh, Luke mentions almost as an understatement. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. I I love the the understatement in the Bible sometimes. Like, how exciting those conversations must have been for Jesus, the risen Lord, to confront his, his frightened, demoralized disciples and for them to realize, no, this man was dead and he's not dead anymore. That's, that's not a one-verse sort of conversation. That's, that's high drama. But unfortunately, we, we are not a part of those conversations. Maybe there's some things you would like to have asked. Maybe there's some doubts that you've had over the years in who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and what he's still doing in this world. He convinced the disciples if we're honest, sometimes we want some convincing ourselves. But for me, the proof is that we are sitting in this room. And how many different countries are represented in this room? Because there's another piece of understatement in this passage. Jesus challenges them, don't leave Jerusalem but wait for my gift. Firstly, these guys were hiding in locked rooms. They weren't starting a missionary journey. They were hiding. They they were only starting, wait, wait, Jesus is not dead? This movement isn't over? And and if they were going to, to leave Jerusalem, it wasn't to begin their missionary calling, it was to run away. 
So Jesus is saying, no, don't, don't run yet. I'm going to send you out. Don't run. Wait for me to equip you with my fire, with my heart. So something happened in this church, in these early Jesus followers, that transformed a group of frightened, demoralized ex-fishermen into a movement that could bring all of us together today. And for me, that, that is proof of the resurrection. Because the movement was dead. We, we forget that. We forget that Jesus was unlike any other religious teacher in his day or in ours. They weren't following him because of his, his ideas. They weren't following him because of his eloquence. They were following him because of who he was, the charisma of his person, the miracles of his hand. And in fact, we, we know they had all different thoughts and beliefs about what the Messiah would be, about who Jesus would be. Even now they're asking, okay, are, are you going to drive the Romans out now? Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said, no, you, you, you guys still don't get it. And, and some of my favorite verses in the Gospels, again, these, these understated, throwaway verses, and then the disciples believed. And then the disciples believed. That, that means they're following Jesus around, and they, they, they were not believers yet. That means Jesus was very comfortable with people who didn't get it, which is a word of encouragement for us. And maybe a word of challenge for us as well. As we are doing missions, as we are building the church, we love to create barriers. I talked about that in the family moment. Yes, the ex-prisoners can come to our church, but only when they have the right clothes and they can speak the right way. That's what the Pharisees said. You, You can join our tribe if you believe this, 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 and this, and you do this, 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 and this. Jesus turned that on its head. He said, no, just just come. You don't understand everything yet. You don't understand who I am yet. Just come. The Pharisees said, join me, change, then join us. Jesus said, join us, and everything will change. That's the heart behind missions. But it's the proof of the resurrection because something happened to take these confused men and and transform them into a missionary movement that could challenge the world, that could change the world. Look, part of the reason I love prison ministry is because there is a moment when the only Christian in the world was a dying prisoner. We, We skip over that part. Like, we, 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 we study the arc of Jesus' ministry. He, he, he comes from nowhere. He comes from Nazareth. Everybody's following him. He's the, he's the popular big thing. There's the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. All that comes to a crashing end at the cross. His closest followers, they, they're on the run. They, they thought the movement is over. We must have been mistaken. His own mother, they, oh, I, I, I must, must have been wrong. The story ends here. They, they weren't looking for the resurrection. They didn't understand that the story was just beginning. They thought, no, this guy is dead. Not metaphorically, not so, no, he's dead, dead. And we must have been wrong. But there was one prisoner who is dying next to Jesus, and he looks over and he says, this this isn't finished yet. Remember me. You know the words. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's a strange request from one dying man to another. Do something for me, Jesus. Wait, he's dying, you're dying? We know how this story ends. But this prisoner... He saw something differently. And that's part of why we do missions. 
Because we, we want to see things differently. We want to see Jesus bring dead things to life. And it's worth leaving our homes to be a part of it. It's worth stepping outside of our comfort zone to be a part of it. So for me, this passage, Acts 1, verse 8, that the fact that we're still encouraging each other with it today is proof that Jesus rose from the dead. But it's more than just proof of the resurrection. It is our marching orders. We're told to go. We're told to, to get moving. Get out of our comfort zones. But there's a piece of this challenge that I was wrongly taught when I was in Sunday school. There's, there's enough seminary students here. I'm sure you guys have it already. But I, I, was, I was told, I was introduced to this missionary challenge as one of geography. You, you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You start with what's close and then you go out. And sure, there's an element of geography in our missionary calling. But it's also about relationships. Jerusalem, those are our closest relationships. That's, that's the start of our missionary journey. It starts in our own family, with our own neighbors. And in some ways, that's the hardest one. I, 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 I laugh a little bit when I'm, when I'm in America and I'm visiting some of the churches that are supporting us. And there is not a single ex-prisoner in their congregation. They're really excited about African prisoners. Yes, we'll support, we'll support Andrew, we'll support Anne, we'll support Hope Prison Ministry. Let, let's, let's, see, let's see the Spirit of God sweep across Africa's prisons. And it's, it's, it's beautiful that they want to be a part of it. As Hope Prison Ministry, there's 25 prisons we're, we're connected to. Mostly here in South Africa. Occasionally we get restless and we go north. But these, these churches are really excited about the ends of the earth. But don't, don't talk to me about my neighbors. Don't talk to me about the prisoners who live within walking distance of my own church. So it starts with what's closest to us. And eventually it, it does end with the ends of the earth, the unknown. Following Jesus will take you in, into the unknown space, out of your comfort zone. It'll, but we, we, skip, we skip too quickly the middle part of the verse. We go straight from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. But Judea and Samaria get a special mention. And again, it's not just about the geography. The Samaritans represented the, the enemies of the Jews. Again, you can, you can talk to one of these seminary students. They'll give you a more full explanation of the, the origins of the Samaritan people as a splinter offshoot of Judaism and, and what that meant. Um, but, for, but for the Jews, the, the Samaritans were, were their enemies. They were unclean. They, they, they were that church on the other side of town that that really has the wrong theology. Do, do they even know Jesus? Do they even, they claim to be worshiping God, they don't get it, no. They're playing church. They, they totally are in the wrong direction. It, again, it's, it's funny for me in prison ministry because sometimes I feel like we have more grace for murderers and rapists than we do for that church on the other side of town that, that, just, that just wants to worship God and is, no, they, they don't understand. Their theology is not right. It's, it's not. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure when I stand before the throne of God, I'm going to discover a few things that I was wrong about as well. And I, just, I praise God that again, I get to stand with the dying prisoner who sat next to Jesus. He didn't do anything. He didn't have special prayers. 
He didn't have, he didn't have, he hadn't figured out the right pattern for worship, for fellowship. He just saw Jesus for who he was. He cried out and he died. And when I get a little too excited about my doctrine sometimes, and I, I, I love a good theological debate, but when I get a little too excited about it, I like to, I like to remember Jesus' answer to the dying prisoner. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So that, that is the missionary challenge. It's not just for your neighbors. It's not just for your family. It's for your enemy. And we, we forget that this is, this is an offensive thing. Like we, we, we're a little too comfortable with Acts. We're a little too comfortable with the Gospels. We, we, for, we forget that what Jesus is saying, it's like... His, his own followers were not happy with his connection to Samaria. The time he spent with a Samaritan woman, the, the fact that the, the Samaritan features so prominently in the, in the parable of, of the, the, well, the good Samaritan. He, he gets one named after him. Though we, we do need to remember those, those headings aren't in the original text. Um, but we, we, we forget that the missionary journey is one that, that, if we are willing, will offend us. Because it calls us, we are called to bring the presence of God, to reflect the presence of God into places where we don't want to be. Um, Moments of impossible forgiveness, moments of impossible reconciliation. That's why we do prison ministry. One of of my my friends, a formerly incarcerated man, he faced faced this, this decision because they killed his brother. His brother was targeted in a gang hit and he had... My, my friend Clayton, he had successfully left the gang. But, but his old friends come to him and said, look, you have to take revenge. They, they put a weapon in each of his hands. We, we found these guys. We need to ride. It's, it's, time, to, it's time to take revenge. Missions. The missionary journey, it's not just about talking. I, I, evangelicals are really excited about how we speak about the Bible. The missionary journey, it's about stepping away from our bitterness, our anger. It's about laying down our weapons and saying, this man over here, he deserves punishment. This man over here, he deserves vengeance. And yet God has called me to go. And sit with him. Minister to him. Another one of my colleagues, he was was teaching a Bible study in Allendale Prison. And a prisoner sits down and he realizes, this man killed my cousin. He wants to be here. I don't want him to be here. In in fact, my, my friend, my coworker Stephen, Before he became a Christian, this murder happened a long time ago, Stephen was hunting this man to kill him as revenge. And now he's sitting in this this Bible study. That is the missionary journey. Are you willing to carry God's love to the man who murdered your cousin? That's what it's talking about when, when Paul... When, when Luke says, when Jesus says, you need to stop in Samaria first. The missionary journey will offend us if we let it. But the reward is great. Because in, in our obedience to that call, we can meet with Jesus. 
Sometimes I think we, we over-spiritualize so much of our faith. Like, I, I do a lot of work with young people who are, who are trying to discover their calling, and they, they, they work themselves up into some kind of a, I don't know, spiritual constipation. Like, what does God want from me? Like, am I supposed to do this or this? I just want God to speak to me. I want God to show up and write it on the wall for me. But you good Old Testament students, you, you know the only time in the Bible where, where God does show up and start scribbling things on the wall. That guy gets killed in his sleep. So we need a different model, maybe, of, of God's guidance. But Jesus has given it to us. That, that's, that's what he gives us in Matthew 25. If you want to be with me, I'm with the refugees, I'm with the sick, I'm with the hungry, I'm with the prisoners. Come spend time with me. That is the Christian journey. That's the mission's journey. We are called, we are invited, we are challenged, we are dared to spend time with Jesus in strange places. And so when I'm working with, with, with young people who are trying to discover the calling of God on their lives, I say, look, he's already told you. He wants to spend time with you. And he's told you where he is. Have you been to a refugee camp? Have you been to a hospital? Have you been to a prison? He's, he, and, and look, I'm not, I'm not trying to put a burden on you. It doesn't say... I was in prison and you started three Bible studies and a counseling ministry. It just said, I was in prison and you showed up. We're just called to show up. And if we keep showing up, if we if, use that list in Matthew 25 as a checklist. Okay, I'm trying to figure out what God wants me to do. I'll try this, then I'll try this, try this. And eventually, he said, no, this is, this is what God made me for. This is where God wants to meet with me. This is where I get to do missions. But your missionary journey, the thing that connects all three of those places, Jerusalem, Samaria, the ends of the earth, the theme that runs through those places is rejection. We reject our neighbors. No, I... That... Let me rather do ministry with the church. I'm not going to talk to that guy. You know, you know what he does in his yard? You, you, you know what his dog does in my yard? Don't talk to me about my neighbors. Then Samaria. No, I, you, can't, you can't be asking me to love the person who killed my brother. That can't be the missionary journey. Or the ends of the earth. No, I'm... I've got no interest in going there. So there's a theme of rejection. There's a barrier of rejection across each one of those places. But I'll give that rejection another name. Nazareth. And so we will end with Philip's challenge. Nathaniel, he... He wanted nothing to do with this, this, new, this new teacher. He doesn't have the credentials. He's from nowhere, and he's going nowhere. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Come and see. When I, when I visit a new prison, they'll tell me the name. Oh, this is such and such a place. No, no, this... This isn't Polesmore. This isn't Drakenstein. This isn't Allendale. This is Nazareth. Because God wants to bring something out of this place. Because God wants to reveal himself in this place. God wants to surprise us. If we are willing to come and see. That's an invitation on behalf of Hope Prison Ministry and, and other organizations. Most Sundays, we do, we do church services at Paulsmore. 
Um, during the week, there's Bible studies happening at Polsmore. Come and visit us sometime. I, 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 don't, I don't want to take you out of this place. This church is amazing. But if, but if you need a dose of something strange, come, come and visit us. I think, I think the, the prisoners need the church and the church needs the prison. And that's, that's at the heart of the missionary journey. God doesn't call us into missions because he needs our help. And that's where I'll end. He, Jesus wasn't sitting in, in heaven at the right hand of the Father. and He said, I, I can't handle Drakenstein prison. I'd better find an American to go sort things out. I'm pretty sure he was doing okay before I got here, and I'm pretty sure God will be doing okay after I leave. So if I'm not necessary for this missionary calling, why is it, why is it so central to Jesus' ministry? Why is it so central to the resurrection? Because in missions, as we answer that call to go, we can taste more of who God is and who we were created to be. So I invite you into prison, not just because there are men and women there who need encouragement, but because Jesus is there and he wants to encourage you. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you assembled your, your disciples from those who were confused, from those who were unqualified, and you were patient with them when they didn't get it. Even after you rose from the dead, they didn't get it. You were patient with them, and I thank you for being patient with us. I pray that you would continue to give us courage, courage to love our neighbors, courage to love our enemies, and courage to step into the unknown. I thank you for the work of mission that this congregation is already doing. And I thank you for the way it's been a blessing to me, to my family, and to prisoners all across this country. I thank you that you have invited us to, to carry your missionary heart and in doing so, to rediscover that dead things come to life. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.